Okay, good afternoon. I'm Alon Confino. I'm the director of the Institute for Holocaust, Genocide, and Memory Studies. And I'm delighted to welcome you uh, to our event about Moses Mendelssohn's afterlives and the invention of modern Jewish remembrance, um, which will discuss Martina Steer's acclaimed book about Moses Mendelssohn. Before we begin, let me do some housekeeping issues. So I'm very happy to announce a joint program of the Institute and the um, Center for Contemporary Jewry at the Hebrew University, which is called Encounters. Uh, it will bring three times each semester two scholars to discuss an important book in the subjects of Holocaust, genocide, human rights, and mass violence, the author of a book and another scholar. Uh, and we are going to begin uh, in a few weeks. Nancy Sitkoff will discuss her book on uh, Lucy Dawidowicz. Um, so all our talks can be found on our YouTube channel, which is called IHGMS UMass Amherst. Uh, you can find it also on our website and our Facebook. Uh, all our past events are recorded uh, and can be shared and distributed widely. Visit our website and Facebook for more announcements and updates. And we have also an email list if you want to join. So Paz will send a link in the chat uh, in a few minutes. The way we are going to do uh, this afternoon our event is we'll start with Abigail Gilman and then Michelle Brenner that will give the evaluation of the book and Martina Steer will respond and then we'll open up for Q&A. At the bottom of your screen you can see a QA and a uh, tab. You can click it and send your question there. You can send it to one of the speakers or to all the speakers. And at the end of the, of the talks, I will moderate the uh, Q&A discussion. So it's my greatest pleasure to have with us today Martina Steer and to discuss her book. Martina teaches modern Jewish history at the University of Vienna, her work has centered over the years on the subjects of Jewish history, collective remembrance, and cultural transfer. We are assembled here today to discuss her book, Moses Mendelssohn und seine Nachwelt, eine Kulturgeschichte der jüdischen Erinnerung, Moses Mendelssohn's Afterlife, a cultural history of Jewish remembrance, which was published last year. A Polish translation will appear next year, and we hope that an English translation will appear soon as well. She is now at work on a social and emotional history of Jewish women in Germany and Austria after 1945. She joins us from Vienna, where it is somewhat later in the day, but she is with us and we are very happy. Abigail Gilman is professor of Hebrew, German, and comparative literature in the, Depart of, in the Department of World Languages and Literatures at Boston University. She is a core faculty of the Elie Wiesel Center for Jewish Studies. She is the author of, most recently, A History of German Jewish Bible Translation, published in 2018. Her current research pertains to the Mashal. The, parabotic, the parabolic style across Jewish literature, the poetics of Aaron Appelfeld, and finally, Jewish translation history. And finally, Michael Brenner is the Simon and Lillian Abenson Chair in Israel Studies and Director of the Center for Israel Studies at American University. He also holds the Chair of Jewish History and Culture at Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. He is a member of several academic boards in Israel, the United States, and Europe, and is the international president of the Leobeck Institute for the Study of German Jewish History and Culture. In 2014, he was awarded 
the Order of the Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany. His latest publications are In Search of Israel, The History of an Idea, and as editor, A History of, Jewish, of Jews in Germany since 1945, both published in 2018. It's my greatest pleasure to welcome all of you and our guests. And Abigail, we're going to start with you. <clears throat> thank you. And um, thank you for inviting me. Um, just, I'm really thrilled to be here. So I want to start out by saying, Martina, that this is a book I wish I had written. <laughs> I think it is utterly fascinating and the topic is irresistible. You took my two favorite topics, memory, Jewish cultural memory, and Moses Mendelssohn, and you put them together. <laughs> um, and um, I think it's utterly, utterly a fascinating book and a fascinating topic. And to explain why I think so, I'm going to give you a bit of context and refer uh, just for a few minutes to my own work as, as I have, as I receive your book. So um, my, in my first book, Viennese Jewish Modernism, I essentially wrote about memory. And I wrote about memory in Vienna 1900, uh, which I regard as a lieu de mémoire, an Erinnerungsort. And when working on that book, I first realized that you could tell the, you could really recount modern Jewish history as a quest for a usable past. And that's a phrase I also took from uh, uh, David Roski's book, a quest for a usable past. And then, if, and also a quest for forms, for new forms of memory. So if you think about the Haskalah and Hasidism and modernism, and the Wissenschaft des Judentums, how each of these periods, each of these groups sought different forms and genres of memory to insert themselves into the dynamic continuum, the Jewish durée. Um, so in my recent book, I tell the story of German Jewish Bible translation. And I tried to understand not only why German Jews produced so many translations of the Torah, but why scholars and rabbis in so many different periods took different approaches to translation. And Mendelssohn is enormously important for that story. As everybody knows, Mendelssohn was the first Jewish translator of the Torah into high, uh, into high German, and he called it the Be'ur. He introduced the name of God as der Ewige, the Eternal One, das Ewige Wesen, which has had tremendous longevity in, Ju in German Jewish translations and also prayer books. He set the standard for all who followed. In writing that history, I had glimpses of the complicated dynamics which Martina traces in her book. I became aware every now and then that there was a great amount of mythologizing around Mendelssohn. And even the idea that Mendelssohn was the first modern Jewish translator was a kind of myth. Um, and you know, at one, one thing I thank you for is that now every time I see any reference to Mendelssohn or any source, I will never take it, <laughs> I will always kind of try to under consider which Mendelssohn is this. Uh, what, what kind of myth of Mendelssohn is this? Which, what, who, who, what is the, I have a, cri a critical eye now for every text, which I already knew when I was writing my book, but it was not so clear to me as it is now. And I'll just give you a few, a few examples. Um, so for the first generation of translators who, who followed Mendelssohn, um, they believe, they, they, they identified themselves as epigons. They were the latecomers. They, they had to follow the monumental Mendelssohn translation. So how do you take down your, your great, you know, your precursor? How do you do it? And the way they articulated it was extremely fascinating to me. And uh, so Josef Jolson, in his preface, paid homage to the great Mendelssohn, the great translator Mendelssohn. But then he cited one verse <laughs> 
uh, from the Mendelssohn Bible from Exodus, and he criticized it on five counts. He said this, why this is, you know, linked philologically, grammatically wrong. And um, Michael Zachs, another scholar translator says, people think I'm, I'm annihilating Mendelssohn and rebelling against him just because I dare to retranslate something that he already translated. And, and the same for Gotthold Salomon, whom you also write about. And he says, we don't need to be critical of Mendelssohn's uh, translation. He did not aspire to produce a great philological translation. He sought to bring light and truth to the Jews. Um, so, you know, we can, so they were, they needed to clear out space for their own work. Now, when I was reading your book, I had so many epiphanies. Um, but the main epiphany, which is also the main argument, is that Mendelssohn became an Erinnerungsort himself. Mendelssohn himself was a site of memory. Mendelssohn was dead, but his significance was a living, breathing entity. And because modernity, because Jewish modernity was taking shape precisely at the time when Mendelssohn, after Mendelssohn died, the mnemotechnics were continuously uh, renegotiated. And that's the story you tell, and it's a paradigmatic story. And, you know, I think that there's really, that, 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 that there's nothing more fascinating than, a, than watching a community or a society engaged in the process of wrestling with the meaning of, um, with the meaning of, uh, 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 of, of, its, um, cult, of, of its cultural memory. And to add to this, the, the concept of the great man, the way that, you know, the evolving kind of cult of the great man, how is a hero commemorated? And how complicated that is. Now, um, and what about the great woman? And I can't help, you know, I can't help but mention that um, in the time I was reading your book, um, we were, we lost Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, the Ruth Bader Ginsburg was maybe a parallel to Moses Mendelssohn. She was the first, the first Jewish woman to lie in state in the Capitol. She was eulogized by a conservative woman rabbi. Um, she opened so many doors. She broke so many barrows. She was our hero. She died in the waning days of the year 5780, Tafshin Pei, just hours before Rosh Hashanah. Someone posted about her, it was a cosmic insult to the Jewish people that she died at that, in those hours. But what happened? People rallied at the Supreme Court, at the building of the Supreme Court. They blew the shofar in her memory. They said Havdalah, they said Kaddish, in front of the Supreme Court on those days following her death. And you provide the framework for understanding that, that kind of commemoration. And what you talk about is um, not only the, the transition from pre-modern um, pre to modern collective forms of collective memory, um, but also, well, 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 that's the historical, that's sort of the historical trajectory, but I think we also need to emphasize that the pre-modern forms of Jewish memory have such tremendous staying power. And uh, when you think of the Seder or the Kaddish or Jewish liturgy, and currently I would say in our cultural moment, um, all of these uh, pre-modern and modern forms are being memed together, <laughs> um, hybridized in so many um, creative ways, especially in Israel, maybe, but all, all around the world. And the underlying narrative about remembering Mendelssohn is, of course, the consolidation of German, Polish, and American Jewish identity. You write, in each phase, Jews remade Mendelssohn in their own image. And you, you, it's so fascinating, tell the story of, the story of remembering Mendelssohn is the, also the consolidation of American Jewish identity, Polish, Eastern European identity, German Jewish identity, and you go to these critical turning points of 1829, 
1879-1929. For people who are listening uh, who haven't read the book, I'm going to just uh, open up a couple of just give them a, a, a give people a sense uh, of your method and talk about some of the very earliest uh, ways that Mendelssohn became remembered because that you really take us into that those years and days really right after he died and I thought that was just so enlightening and and moving and um, and then I'll just close with a couple of questions for you um, but I, I have to tell some of these to kind of recount these um, because I think everyone here is in some way affected by this if they've been faced with a situation of commemorating or watched processes of commemoration as they take shape. So um, you you know your book starts with Mendelssohn's funeral procession. You know, and uh, you know the question of whether people, whether there was a procession, and whether people walked behind his coffin or not. And this is a a, a ritual that is, you know, just starting at the very, very uh, uh, beginning after he died. As you said, there's no committee or no no institutions <laughs> would would help the Maskilim figure out how to how to start to memorialize him and how to remember him that they were the first stewards the family members but then the masculine were stewards the first stewards of his memory and then you you talk about the communicative phase where the first accounts were found in letters and then among the scholars the disputes whether did his his argument with Jacobi was that responsible for his early death was he a martyr for Lessing um, for, you know, because he worked so hard to write that piece defending Lessing? Um, then you talk about how the enlightened, the scholars of the Enlightenment um, begin to, the Zeitzeuge, begin to write about him. The, the genre of the short biography. I discovered this genre in the Leo Beck Institute uh, archives when I was writing my book. And because um, there were so many of them written in the 19th century, Philipson and Herrickson, all these rabbis had, there were all these short, bi short popular biographies. I absolutely love them. Um, but how did they, how did they, who, how did they style him? He said he was, like, became a kind of ubermensch. The friendship of Lessing and Mendelssohn, how extraordinary important that was. Irresistible, really, as a way of, um, uh, um, a, 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 an image, a way to remember him, to link him to Lessing, which is a theme running through the whole period of your book. And then the op idea of a denkmal, of a monument, and a musical composition, <laughs> uh, music dedicated to him, and a, and a Klagelied, or a, a, a from um, Hertz Vesely. And of course, Hertz Vesely also wrote a poem for Mendelssohn for the prospectus of the Biur, Mahalel Rea. I think that was Wesley. So you have this Hebrew poetry and the Hebrew, and then, you know, the, the first Hebrew biography by Isaac Oichelon, who was that written for? Um, and that that um, solidified the myth of, of Mendelssohn as the founder of the Haskalah. So all of these, the, all of these different genres, um, all of these different genres that from the, 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 what you call the Zeitzeuge. I think German, you give us so many great terms. There's, there's something about German. There's so many great terms for, for talking about collective memory in German. Uh, um, and um, so they, were, they knew they were shaping the memory of Mendelssohn and they were also writing themselves into the story and writing their own agendas into the story um, and to further their own goals. So there's the instrumentalization that is always seems to be going on in, um, in the creation of, of new forms of memory. So um, I guess I have just two or three um, uh, uh, questions for you. And one is, um, where do you think we are today with uh, Mendelssohn's memory? Because I look around and I see many new, new uh, translations of his work, 
uh, new scholarly books, my colleagues in colleague, my colleagues in philosophy who don't know anything about uh, Bible translation, study Mendelssohn. You make a distinction, you know, does the work matter or the personality matter? And I think it seems today that really the work absolutely matters. But also new translations of his Hebrew works, new translations of the of the Beor. So where are we today is, is uh, one question for you. Um, another question is, um, if you were planning the 19, uh, we're, we're a few years away from the 300th uh, jubileum, uh, and I'm wondering what we should be doing to prepare for that. Um, and and, and um, of course, one of the most fascinating shifts that you talk about is the shift from the yard site to jubileum. So a yard site commemorates the death day, but the jubileum comm commemorates the birthday. So what are we going to be doing in 1929? And, and finally, I, I, I want to uh, open up this topic, which I maybe Alon and Michael uh, also would have, I think, uh, some very interesting things to say about. Because you, you say it in your, at the end of your preface that much of the scholarship on memory is connected to the Holocaust. And um, there's been such a tremendous literature on Jewish, on Jewish memory, arts of memory, mnemotechnics, historians, and, and cultural, and liter in, in almost every genre, there is really no end in sight to how many different genres of, of Holocaust memory, how many different forms, how many, and then the ongoing dialogue, and this is just a tr like a tremendous uh, body of um, uh, uh, corpus, and you 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 offer a, a a criticism or a kind of corrective to say that that I think you use the word pre presentish. You say that to some extent it's a. I, I'm not sure if I understand you, so you could explain. But um, we need to go back to the pre-Holocaust called Jewish culture, and um, uh, as well, and try to see the you know as that there is as much going on there in terms of new media. Uh, um, multimedia, global tra cultural transfers, and um, and the interweaving of so many factors, religious, political, social, cultural, etc., um, going on in Jewish culture throughout throughout history. Um, so I, I just again very grateful um, to you for this book, and uh, I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Uh, should I just continue? Okay. Uh, well, thank you, first of all, for inviting me. Uh, and, and I feel especially um, personally touched because uh, Martina and I actually go back for a long time. I remember she was actually one of my very first students when I was in Munich uh, almost 25 years ago. Uh, and, uh, of course, as... Uh, had her own uh, wonderful career and uh, what Abigail just said, I could just uh, totally underline. This is a book I also wish I would have written. Um, I, I wrote a very small essay on this topic uh, many years ago. And as, as very often one thinks, oh, I could expand it and I can make a real study out of it. Uh, but I know I couldn't have written it as well as you did, Martina. So thank you really for giving us this book. And especially, I think, expanding it because what the book does it's not just the usual perspective the german jewish memory of mendelssohn uh, in every chapter you bring in uh, a polish perspective and an american perspective of memory and i think that really um puts also the german memory in perspective so i think it's a wonderfully structured book also in terms of the um that each chapter looks at the different dimensions of memory, of the Erinnerungsort, of the place of memory, of course, uh, not taken literally, uh, but also the celebrations and, and sets the whole scene um, uh, with every new either yard site or jubileum um, from the late 18th century 
uh, to the mid 20th century. Um, and, and, and I agree totally uh, with what Abigail said. Um, it's two amazing topics. First of all, we know Mendelssohn, of course, for every historian of Jewish history uh, or for a literature person or for any person in Jewish studies, in fact, Mendelssohn is so central. And I also happen to be, I don't know why, always a fan of these afterlife histories. And uh, I think uh, there's a whole literature of Shakespeare's afterlives by now and, and, and some others. But for Mendelssohn, it's the first. And I, I also once uh, was uh, very proud to be the dissertation advisor for a student who wrote on Herzl's afterlife, which is a really interesting story by itself. So let me begin with... Um, what is, of course, a certain irony of memory. If you um, think of Mendelssohn, he is, as I already said, the central figure in modern, in, in, in certainly beginning the, the period of modern Jewish history. He was called the archetypal modern Jew. Um, his biographer, Alexander Altman, called him the patron saint of German Jewry. Uh, he, in way, many ways, was the first uh, modern Jew uh, to walk in these two worlds, the Jewish world and the German world. Maybe not always too comfortably, but he did. And uh, for most 19th century historians, he was the person to lead the Jews, as they put it very colorful, always out of darkness into the light. And they literally put it that way. Uh, Isaac Marcus Joost wrote, with him Judaism saw the dawn of a more beautiful day. And for Heine, he even was a Jewish Luther. So um, it's then also hardly surprising that Mendelssohn was the only figure who made it into the canon of the Lieu de Memoire, the German version of not the original French book, but the German book uh, called German Erinnerungsorte, Lieu de Memoire, which actually appeared in three volumes in 2001. And uh, he was the only Jewish uh, person to make it into this volume, into all of those three volumes. He did so as the author of this uh, biographical sketch, uh, Jacques Ehrenfreund wrote, as the symbolic figure which accompanies and towers above the life of the Jewish minority in Germany from the end of the 18th century until the destruction through the Nazis. So, I'm coming to my irony. I know that was a long <laughs> uh, prologue. The irony is, of course, that when you look at the actual memory in the central places um, of his, um, maybe, you know, we, we, we think what's the central place of Jewish life? Uh, it's, of course, Jerusalem. And uh, even his, the title of his most important study on Jewish religious philosophy was Jerusalem. But there is nothing that reminds uh, of him in Jerusalem. There's no street name. And of course, we know why, and I'll maybe go a little bit into that in a minute. But even in Berlin, I mean, there is not that much that reminds of him. And especially people don't, uh, if you hear them in Germany today, if you say the name Mendelssohn, maybe some people would say, oh yeah, the composer, sure. And of course, it's Felix, his, uh, his grandson. So, in that way, even though he's so important for us in scholarship, he remains so important. And he was so, he was the patron saint of German Jewry. I wonder, next year is another big uh, jubileum in Germany. It's not Mendelssohn, but it's 1700 years of at least documented German Jewish life, which will be uh, celebrated a lot next year. I wonder which role Mendelssohn will take. We'll, we'll have to wait and see. Um, so, one of the reasons we don't have much uh, memory or, or nothing really remembering Mendelssohn in Jerusalem or in Israel in fact, is what is also portrayed so well in the book, um, the, this Histoire Croise, this very um, di you know, different interpretations of Moses Mendelssohn from the beginning. Um, he was, of course, Moses, uh, the sage from Dessau, Rav Moshe mi Dessau for one, and he was Moshe Fresser for the others, as they called him very um, 
uh, you know, negatively, um, deridingly, the one who, who, who basically was not kosher for, for many of the Orthodox and the Zionists. And that's an interesting story because Mendelssohn could have been and was, when you show this in the book, uh, and was also taken, first of all, was claimed for all of the streams of German Jewry. Um, certainly the main liberal stream, uh, and then also some of the Orthodox for the, in the 19th century could claim Mendelssohn very much because he was observant. Um, and uh, even some of the Zionists were able to claim him for them, for their own camp and saying, you know, he was the first to have revived Hebrew. Um, and, and of course there's some basis to that. Um, but of course, as we see in the course of the uh, late 19th and especially then early 20th century, especially among the Zionists and Orthodox, and of course coming from the East European Haskalah of the 19th century, um, he, his image um, became also um, increasingly negative and he was more identified, and I know a lot of uh, um, our participants know that, he was of course more identified um, with the fate of his children uh, and his ancestors and his, sorry, descendants in general, who um, ultimately, I believe, uh, not in the first generation, but later um, all converted to Christianity. So this is, I would say that these are the parameters of this book and, and, and they're really shown um, so wonderfully. I, I just want to say a few more words about um, the time I uh, personally most uh, interested, maybe have most to say, which is the Weimar Republic and especially 1929 um, Jubilee. <clears throat> and then also maybe ask a couple, well, one or two questions. Um, in one of the uh, many uh, laudatory comments in the newspaper reports about the 1929 celebration of Mendelssohn's um, jubilee, the Berlin Fossische Zeitung wrote that this perspective included um, uh, 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 the um, Bertha Bachstrauss, who of course you know quite well, Martina, she wrote, one should have borrowed one of the many bicycle bells for those speeches to abbreviate the ceremony and to expel the funeral atmosphere, which is emanating from the hollow sound of the celebrations. We all know this. We go to these jubilees, one speech after the other, one government official, the mayor, nobody has ever read Mendelssohn and that's kind of what it sounded. And as you wrote in the book, of course, there was also a condescending view of the Berlin paper on the main events which took place in his birthplace of Dessau, in provincial Dessau. Um, but what I find interesting is that just, you know, aside from these, uh, um, celebrations. Um, 1929 was also the Lessing year, of course, but it was also the year in which the probably most significant living German Jewish philosopher died. That was Franz Rosenzweig. And so there is this strange incident, a strange coincidence that you have the first translator of the Bible into uh, German. Uh, first Jewish translator into German, uh, Moses Mendelssohn celebrated, and in the same year, um, maybe the last, of course, together with Martin Buber, the last translator, Jewish translator of the German Bible, in, of the Hebrew Bible into German, was laid to rest. And, and I thought that was quite interesting because some of the most significant, um, I think, um, not just uh, revisions of a translation came from Rosenzweig and Buber, but I always think of this one quote which always touched me of Rosenzweig um, when he wrote about modern German Jewry and, 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 and he wrote the sentence, from Mendelssohn on, the Jewishness of every individual has squirmed on the needle point of a Y has squirmed on the needle point of a Y. So Mendelssohn, in a way, was also for him responsible 
for opening a new chapter of, well, were Jews questioned their own identity? Were they enlarged their identity, but were they also started to question it? And I think that's something um, which I just found striking also because of the coincidence in that year, 1929. Um, in, in, in their own ways, um, I think <clears throat> they had a lot of common, Mendelssohn and Rosenzweig. Rosenzweig, they of course both felt German and Jewish. Mendelssohn was the first one to, in a way, enter this German cultural world as an equal. Uh, Rosenzweig tried to recreate the Jewish cultural sphere for so many German Jews who were assimilated and who were, in, so, so they came from different directions. Feel the same, um, well, attempt to feel equally at home in the German and the Jewish cultural universe. And um, one quote which I did not know before, which I learned from your book, um, which I also found very striking, was when Martin Buber was asked to speech to speak in 1929. He wrote in a letter, I think. Um, he wrote, and let's just say it in German first. Über Mendelssohn kann ich natürlich nicht sprechen. Of course, I cannot speak about Mendelssohn. And I was, you know, it was the natürlich, the of course, which struck me. So Buber, who could speak about a lot of things and did speak about a lot of things, and as many critics said, did speak about a lot of things he didn't know that much about, that's mean. Um, he said, of course, I cannot speak about Mendelssohn. I was wondering why. And maybe it's so obvious, maybe it's because he was a Zionist or maybe because he was so critical and didn't want to speak at the Jubilee or maybe for other reasons. And I don't know if you have an answer to this. And um, again, I think it shows how in 19, by 1929, the Mendelssohn reception also had become anything but just celebratory, just uh, laudatory. There was a lot of doubts and criticism um, among these German Jewish thinkers involved, also from Rosenzweig and Buber, and of course the Orthodox, and um, one of the quotes again you bring is from Josef Wolgemuth, the, Orthodox, the editor of the Orthodox journal, Yeshurun, who said, sure, he kept the mitzvot, but without, ohne echte Empfindung und Überzeugung, without um, genuine, um, feeling and conviction, uh, or emotions and conviction. And that, of course, is pretty harsh. And I think that is uh, uh, um, something which the Orthodox, um, which, which, by the way, by that time also was part of the new criticism of the Orthodox in Germany of their founding father, Samson Raphael Hirsch. So maybe one of the questions we can ask us today is really, and I think that's what Abigail also uh, alluded to, um, yes, what, was, what has Mendelssohn to tell us today? And, and why actually would he be relevant uh, for us today? I think that's an obvious question. Um, and does it matter that he was not able to actually set an example which his own children would follow? Is this something we should disregard or is this something maybe his critics uh, were not totally wrong to, write, to raise? Um, and the last question uh, I, I wrote down is, um, I don't know if Mendelssohn, who sometimes even in, by 1929, many people seem to see him a little bit of dusted, verstaubt, if he today, if he would be revived in the right way, and I don't know if that's possible, uh, could also be a, um, somebody for people to identify um, who combined two cultures in general, not just like, you know, obviously the German and Jewish example, but I was thinking, of course, of Muslim immigrants in Germany who tried to not give up the one culture while hold fast hold fast to that color, but enter another one. Or, you know, I don't know, immigrants to America as well. Um, although, of course, he was not an immigrant. 
um, and, and Jews weren't in the 18th century. So these are some of the issues I, that came to my mind while um, reading this book. And of course, uh, it's so rich that I could have asked and raised so many more issues and questions. Can you hear me? Yes, now you can hear me. Okay, thank you so much for your remarks and the questions. First of all, thanks to Alon for hosting us and just giving me the, the, the opportunity to discuss my book. Thanks to Michael, thanks to Abigail again for your comments and remarks. Yes, I have to admit, I have a, when I read that book, of course, I borrowed from you, Alon. You can read it in the introduction. And I think um, this was one of the main incentives to structure the book um, according to the lines, the community of, of people who commemorated Mendelssohn, uh, then the staging of, of the commemoration, of course, um, the site of memory itself, value de memoria Mendelssohn. Um, because as you said, we don't just um, um, research memory just to do it and to, to because it was it would only be a history of the reception or perception of Mendelssohn, but I think we should also ask for how collective memory or remembrance shapes social reality. And I think along the lines of along the structure of my, my book, I, at least I try to, to answer a couple of questions which are related. Um, to, to, um, to the questions, how collective memory shapes reality, how it shapes um, society, politics, and not necessarily only vice versa. So, um, yeah, I think I simply start answering all the questions. Thanks for the praise of my book. I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you made it through. I know it's thick, it's, it's rich. Sometimes it's redundant, it's repetitive. I totally agree on that, <laughs> but I, I, there were so many fascinating sources and I simply couldn't let them go and, and because, yeah, everyone who, who's been researching has this um, variety of sources and material knows of what I'm talking about. Um, probably I start with your first question, Abigail, and the, your last one, Michael. Where are we today with Moses Mendelssohn? Wow, I mean, this is... Again, it depends on whom you ask, you know, what does, what does, what does Mendelssohn mean for certain groups? I mean, it, he does not mean everything to the same person, obviously. So um, I'd like to refer to an incident a couple of years ago, and I think, Michael, you're very well familiar with that. Um, the Jewish Gymnasium High School in, in Berlin was in need of a new name. Um, the Parent Teacher Association, um, primarily non Jewish Parent Teacher Association of that school, um, said, okay, let's name our Jewish gymnasium after Moses Mendelssohn because we stand for tolerance and we want to indicate that sign uh, signal this in, in the name of our school. And then the Jewish community of Berlin said, no, you can't do that um, because uh, Mendelssohn, whose children um, converted to Christianity, or at least his, his, his grandchildren converted to Christ Christianity, is not a very good role model for Jewish children and not a very good role model for a Jewish school. So in, at the very end, the, the Parent Teacher Association um, um, won, and of course the high school was named after Moses Mendelssohn. It's now today called Joseph Mendelssohn Gymnasium. So, so there you can see the conflicts which still evolve around Mendelssohn. There you have people who think he's important. He has to say a lot of us being, is it because of his exemplary life, which Michael um, explained to us as the first German Jew, as the one who stood for the beginning of a modern, of a Jewish modernity, as the first Jew, Jew who, um, who lived a life, who had this double existence between German culture and Jewish religiosity. Um, it depends on, 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 what, on, on the people who commemorate Mendelssohn. And I think that's, would you go to Israel or would you go, let's say, to Williamsburg? The answer would be quite differently. 
Um, of course, they still condemn Mendelssohn. And as I've mentioned in, in, in the very first part of my book, and to them, of course, they would say Mendelssohn, or they would not even mention his name, but to, the, to them, he's still the, 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 the prime villain of, of modernity who brought everything back, uh, back to Judaism, and he was the, the starting point of a very, very negative development, assimilation, conversions, mixed marriages, and things like that. So that's one thing when you talk about the person. I mean, the perspective is quite different, I think. And this is why I think this is a question which is hard to answer. When we look at the work of Mendelssohn, I was writing with uh, Shmuel Feiner yesterday or a couple of days ago, and I'm not, I don't know if he's participating in that event. Um, and he's working on a Hebrew translation of Jerusalem. So, and I asked him, who is, who is your target group? Who is going to read that book in Israel? And he said, yeah, actually we don't know, but it, of course, it would, it could be a signal of tolerance. It could be also be a political statement in our, in our Israeli society. And I think that's an interesting point. And um, so I wouldn't say, yeah, of course, Moses Menzer, he is a little bit verstaut. Yes, I agree. But of course, um, you can read him anew, his works anew. I think you could also look at this person from from a new angle, you know. Um, so I think there are a lot of, the, I think we could have some use of Moses Mendelssohn, but it depends on who wanted to use him. You wanted to instrumentalize his memory and, and that group or this collective is going to shape the, 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 the memory of Mendelssohn according to, to, their, um, to their goals, their aims. I mean, that's, that's one thing. And this is what happened the last 200 years when people commemorated Mendelssohn. They shaped Mendelssohn according to their beliefs, according to their hopes, according, how they, according to the interpretation of the past. And I think this yeah, is one of the very fascinating aspects of collective memory, that it's such a fluid concept. And that new de memoirs can be so fluid and so flexible and, and and this makes it very fascinating, but also very difficult to write such history. Um, yeah, and how would we prepare for the 300th anniversary of, of Moses Mendelssohn's birthday? I have to admit, no one asked me about that, but this is probably also because um, I think a couple of years ago, we had an um, anniversary of the beginning of the Mendelssohn family in Berlin, 225 years of the marriage between um, Moses and Promet. I mean, yeah, what, it depends on, on who wants to organize such a, an anniversary. Um, Jahrzeit or birthday? Yes. I was asking them when I was working on the book, should I include the Jahrzeit? And then I opted for the birthday because um, I wanted to underline or emphasize the the very the new the, the new aspect of collective of Jewish collective memory. And I think this is better um, shown um, with a birthday than with a yard site. I mean, there were yard site celebration in 1886, of course, and it was a big you can't say celebration. Um, in Dessau, they had a service, and they, of course, they had the memorial speeches and talks and lectures, and they, of course, published, um, they published books and articles on, on that yard site. You, you have the same thing, of course, to a much smaller, on a much smaller scale in Poland and in, in the United States. But it, for, my, for my purpose, trying to show the entanglement between the various collective memories between, let's say, Germany, Poland, and the United States, um, it would even, it would only have added another layer. It, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have added something new, let's put it that way. It wouldn't have helped my argument more because, of course, you have the, the, the services and the celebration and the speeches and so on, but there, I couldn't find anything which was not um, already present um, in 1879. 
because also in, in 1879, they held the celebrations primarily in, in synagogues, not in some assembly halls or, or in public, um, public institutions um, like they did in 1829 or in 1929. They held the, the memorial services um, so this is why I opted for the group. It was just a matter of choice. And so then, yeah, Abigail, you mentioned that there's a lot, yeah, I, I mentioned it in the introduction, in the preface, that there's a lot of literature on memory, especially on Holocaust memory. And yeah, I, I, it's not that I'm questioning that or I'm criticizing that, but I think when we talk about memory um, or collective memory, we should, we cannot only talk about the, the, the memory of the Holocaust, because I think, yes, when I say um, the Holocaust memory is presentist, yes, I, it's, what I want to say is that um, when you look at it, it's the, it's a collective memory, obviously, after 1945. And the conclusions um, we get from analyzing Holocaust memory, I think it's very interesting to explain um, let's say, collective memory after 1945, but I think it's hard to um, apply it to memory before 1945, especially when we look at the late 18th century or the early 19th century. And also, I think it's not the only, I think the Holocaust and connected with the memoirs and connected rituals of memorialization is it's not the only, um, it's not the only, um, it's not the only memory we have when we talk about collective memory, even not in the Jewish case. I mean, there are, I mean, I, I singled out, I, I chose, I opted for Moses Mendelssohn because he was so obvious to me, but of course you could find many, many other beauty memo, Jewish beauty memoirs before 1945. And just as Michael said to me, um, Moses Mendelssohn was the central Yudi memoir, and during my research, I found it very interesting that I, I didn't hear from, let's say, um, Derek Yostelevich, um, the Polish Jewish freedom fighter from the late 18th century. I would have expected that he became a Polish Jewish Yudi memoir because he was really a hero. He fought in, 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 in an uprising against the Russian occupiers. But still, compared to his um, commemorate the commemoration of his person was compared to the commemoration of Mendelssohn, rather small, not so important. Um, and the same is true for Chaim Solomon in the United States, who was one of the of the important one of the important um, financiers of the American Independence War. I mean, of course, we have a we have a, um, a memorial now. But um, in several in, in 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 the United States, I think it's in New York. But still, when I looked at these anniversaries, I mean, there's just it's not that there's nothing. But compared to Moses Mendelssohn, um, there's there's much less on ritual, on articles, on 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 that people um, commemorated. So and and and. I, I don't have a good answer for that. I mean, I tried to answer that, why these two very obvious people, um, Derek Yosevich and Chaim Solomon, why they were compared to Mendelssohn, so less important or less present, less obvious as, as, as Yuri Memoirs. Um, but yeah, it, it's something I, I cannot answer very well, I have to admit. Um, but Coming back to your questions, I think we have to, when we talk about Jewish collective memory, we have to look into the, the we have to look into the period before 1945. It hasn't necessarily been Moses Mendelssohn. As I said, um, there are many other Yudi memoirs equally fascinating. Um, but still, when we want to learn something about Jewish collective memory, um, we have to look um, in the period before 1945. And this is something um, which was also very, um, with, which was one of the starting points of, of that book was, of course, Josef Yaroshal misspoke Zachor when he was um, when he wrote about the ever-growing decay of Jewish collective memory, and 
and which I would somehow underline, of course, I'm not challenging that, but I'd like to adapt that a little bit and say, we are, yeah, it's a decline of traditional Jewish collective memory, but it was not replaced by Jewish uh, historiography, by the Wissenschaft des Judentums. Of course, it, so, of course, it emerged at that time, but, um, but I think that Jewish collective memory did not vanish, but it simply, no, not simply, but it, it did not vanish, but it transformed into something new. And this is what I try to explain in, in the very first chapters um, of my book. Um, coming to Michael's questions, um, yeah, Martin Buber's remark that natürlich kann ich nicht über, über Moses Mendelssohn sprechen. Of course, I cannot talk about Moses Mendelssohn. Yeah, actually, I don't know. It says, it, it just, to me, it seems so odd. I mean, so at first, when I first saw it, I thought, okay, that's obvious. Of course, you cannot talk about Moses Mendelssohn. But, I mean, Franz Rosenzweig, he sent a, a welcome remark to a Mendelssohn celebration in Frankfurt am Main. So he could do it, but Martin Buber couldn't do it. I don't know. I mean, the, he could have said something. He could have written something. I mean, talk, talking and writing about Mendelssohn also put some emphasis to that person. I mean, commemorating Mendelssohn, it's not something, you, you don't have to do it necessarily in a very positive way. You commemorate also negative Yiddish memoirs. So, but just the very fact that you commemorate something or someone puts some emphasis to that person. And this is why I always, I think it's also so fascinating about the other Orthodox or the Haredim, where they still talk about Moses Mendelssohn. Of course, they don't mention his name because his name is supposed to be erased. But still, to them, for them, he's still an important Yudin memoir, although they see him very negatively, but he is a Yudin memoir to them. Um, that's one thing, and probably we can answer this is and provides an answer to, to, to Martin Buber's um, remark in the letter. I think it was to Ernst Simon, but I'm not sure about it at the moment. Um, yeah, coming here. This is um, already in the year 1929, yeah. Um, you said that the celebration was anything but laudatory. And yes and no, I think. I think yes and no. When you look at the official celebrations of Mendelssohn, the, the, the big celebration in, uh, let's say, in Berlin, in the Sing Academy, in the, in the State Library, Unter den Linden, when you look at the, the celebration organized by the state of Anhalt, um, of course, this was laudatory. It was not pretty, it was, by no means it was critical. It was, it was, they, they but they, this is, when they um, organized these um, celebrations, I mean, they were, this was kind, they instrumentalized the commemoration, the memory of Manson in order to, um, put, not to, not to position, but to secure the position within German society, which grew increasingly hostile towards them. And I think for this purpose, I think Manson still, um, was of good use because, as Leo Beck said in in his in his talk or in his speech in Berlin, he said, "Yeah, Mendelssohn could I mean could serve as kind of a cultural ambassador for Germany um, because he um, because he um, is a symbol for tolerance. He is a symbol of civility and and several other aspects." But of course, when you look at the at inner Jewish debates about Mandelson, of course, this was anything but, but laudatory because I think what most Jewish, what most people agreed upon when they talked about Mendelssohn in 1929 was that for an inner Jewish development, how should um, how should Jewry um, how should, how should um, Curie um, deal with the current situation in Germany? Or, no, how should they deal? How, do, how should they develop um, 
I think Manson was none of the good news because they said, yeah, he was a German, he was a Jew, but what can you tell us for, for a inner Jewish development? How, where should we proceed? And, and to them, he didn't give any answers to them. But I, can, I think towards um, their relationship, for the relation to, to, um, to define and to, to, to define the relationship between Jewry and the non-Jewish world, I think he still um, was of good use at that time. And I think this is why I would not say that um, the celebration in general was anything but laudatory, was anything but laudatory. I think we have to look at the who commemorated Mendelssohn in which context. And then we can we have to differentiate a little bit. And the other thing is that, of course, when we when we compare the commemoration of Mendelssohn in 1929 to that of 1829, I mean 1829 was the age of the of the superheroes, of the patron saint, of this was the heroic epoch, uh, age. So I mean Mendelssohn was not the only only cultural hero of that age. This was a European phenomenon. So, but in 1929. What I think was so fascinating is that the commemoration of Mendelssohn became more and more sophisticated. It became more and more academic. And hence, it became more and more, um, of course, critical. And it became more and more um, differentiated. So I think with the means of, of, of the Enlightenment, you know, with rationality, I mean, with the very means of the Enlightenment, the, 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 um, the commemoration of Manson became, of course, it to a certain extent more critical. So, um, yeah, of course, the, the, the Orthodox, I totally agree. I mean, there's Josef Wohlgemuth, um, he was highly critical of, of Mendelssohn. There were other Orthodox voices at that time who at least admitted that Mendelssohn had to say something was very um, valuable as a person who was Jewish and German, and he could serve as a role model, of course, how to live in, in Germany, so to say. And the other things, Mendelssohn today, Mendelssohn is a bit busted. Yes, I think we, I, I mentioned it at the very beginning because this was your last questions, Michael, were um, Abigail's first questions. And with that, yeah, I hope I answered your questions. And, So Paz, you can put all of us on the screen now. And thank you so much for this fascinating discussion. I have a question that it's a question to all of you or to none. And you kind of raised it and, and, and talked about it. So what does it, what does Mendelssohn mean today in terms of Jewish collective remembrance? It seems that the Jewish national movement not only was based on Jewish pasts and Jewish remembrances, but also was a, a break from a lot of them. Um, and in the sense of Mendelssohn, how difficult it is to commemorate him in Israel. Um, so Michael talked about revival in the right way. Um, so let's say that you are called by, uh, I don't know, by some kind of a government uh, to head the, um, uh, to head the celebratory events for the 300 years jubileum of Mendelssohn. How would you, how would you propose to uh, commemorate him so he will also be relevant I mean, commemoration now is not going to be like in uh, 1929 or in, or in 1829, of course not. So how can we commemorate, if at all, Mendelssohn um, these days? Yes, Abigail. Well, I, ha I have an idea as I'm listening to all of you. Um, and I think we've made a lot of progress um, since 1929 in, in one respect. 
I thought I always had the sense that it that, that it was very unfair that that Buber and Rosenzweig had to rhetorically um, oppose Mendelssohn. They somehow held Mendelssohn responsible for everything that had gone wrong for German Jewry. And since they were trying to make this really strong intervention through cultural renaissance, through translation, through Hasidism, through uh, the Lair House, through, stake, through creating these very radical new forms of Jewish engagement, and that if you were for a German, a Jewish national, re, Jewish cultural revival or Zionism, you had to oppose him. But now, a hundred years later, I mean, what I see with the mentioning of Feiner's you know, the, a new translation of Jerusalem, and we, and we know really that in Israel, you know, you can, it, Israeli, it, Israeli scholars are in some ways the most now open to the diaspora, culture of the diaspora, and to seeing even Israeli, you know, Hebrew writers as diasporic writers, and multilingual, so the, the, the um, I think that, uh, you know, we to this extent, you, you don't have to, you can be a Zionist and, and you don't have to be anti-Mendelssohn anymore. And I think that's real progress. Yes, it is progress. Yes, Michael, please. Michael, you are, you are muted. Thank you. <laughs> First of all, uh, I just want to say one thing about what Martina's uh, comment was. I, I did not mean to say that the 1929 celebrations were not laudatory. If I said that, I, 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 that's not what I meant to say. Uh, I meant to say that these ceremonies were often, you know, derided as in the quote, and, and, and as you said, the inner Jewish discourse was very different, but of course they were laudatory. Um, so I, I, again, it depends, as you said before, Martina, it depends really where, and if, if I were in Israel, <laughs> it probably would be much easier to do it in Tel Aviv than in Jerusalem. Um, what I would uh, suggest to do is to stress maybe the elements that are more provocative for each society, and they are different. In Israel, um, I mean, it is really stressing that he was an important Jewish thinker who believed that you could not understand uh, the Jewish tradition without being, or you could not live the Jewish tradition anymore in a, in a modern age, which he just entered in a way, without also being part and understanding and contributing to this, to this society around you. And, and in Israel, I mean, this is not just the society around you, uh, you know, in, 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 in the literal sense, but the world around you. So I think that's what I would stress in Israel. If I were in, in the diaspora, maybe, uh, it would be the other element of Mendelssohn that, uh, yes, you um, actually, it is important um, to stress uh, also, um, for example, the knowledge of Hebrew and the Jewish values. And, and, and I don't know if it has to be you know, observance or not, but at least the, the, the knowledge about it. Uh, so I think it is different. I would stress the, 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 the more provocative points in, in, both, in all of those different environments. Um, but it's hard. I mean, one has to find something to connect Mendelssohn with the young generation today. And that's our students or, you know, or, or high school students. What can is what is exciting about Mendelssohn to connect him to a young generation. And that's not such an easy task. I think that hasn't been an easy task for a while. Maybe that he was, that he was a radical in his own way. That he was a, I mean, radical, not a, that he was, that he did something new. He, he, he was a, a, a right. path breaker. He was a, something yeah. like this, that he, oh. Yes, he, he did not conform yes. to the usual ways of his group. Yes, I agree. And and if I may add one element, in the American society of today, it's something you also said, Martina, before. Civility and modesty would be maybe <laughs> something. And of course, you know, we're not talking here about scholarly celebrations, but about where societies are 
going and drifting to. And and maybe he was something, he, maybe that was radical. And maybe the moderation he in a way also propagated in its own way was radical too. Yes, Martina, please. Yeah, I mean, what can I say? I think, I think Israeli Zionists should get some inspiration from Polish Zionists from the beginning of the 20th century because they did not see Mendelssohn that negatively. When you look at the Polish literature, Polish Zionist literature of that time, I mean, they were not overwhelmingly, not as negatively as you might have expected from Peret Smolenskin's writing about Mendelssohn. I mean, they took Mendelssohn as a person who first who brought modernity to to to, um, to Jewry, and this is to them was a value in itself. The other thing is that he introduced, according to them, I'm just quoting from from their narrative, um, that um, Mendelssohn somehow invented Hebrew as a secular language for them, or at least fostered the use the secular use of Hebrew which was also important for them. Um, for the Bundist, for example, it, the Bible translation was very important because um, he, uh, he made the, the, the Bible, um, um, how do you say, now I forgot that, it's late, now I forgot the, the, the English word, but to them, to them the Bible translation was important because it was translated into this German Jewish um, language in Yiddish. And these were so they, they picked out several aspects of Mendelssohn's life and Mendelssohn's um, work, which fitted into their agenda. And so, but I think you can't say that scientists in general see Mendelssohn very negatively. But of course, as Michael said at the very beginning, there is no place mentioned uh, named after Mendelssohn in Jerusalem nowadays. I think in Tel Aviv. It's a very small street, as far as I remember. And there are two or three other Mendelssohn streets in, in Israel. And it's not quite clear whether they are named after Moses Mendelssohn or Mendelssohn Bartoli, so, <laughs> or probably after an architect. So. Um, that's, for one thing. that's one thing. But, um, Michael, you also brought a civility. But civility, actually, it's, this is also something which was very, this is an image of Mendelssohn as the impersonation of civility. This is, this is an, the image of Mendelssohn um, conveyed in, in, in the early 19th century. When you look at the Mendelssohn, the, the, the image of Mendelssohn um, in 1879, um, 79, when the, you have the rise of anti-Semitism, racist anti-Semitism, um, the, the Mendelssohn still, he's not, he, he turned into a, a, not aggressive, but camperish, what's that in English? I am lacking that word. Uh, someone who fought for Jewish communities and who fought against, um, 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 who fought against anti-Jewish discrimination. So they, they tried to copy that image of Mendelssohn. So you can see that it, Again, it depends. It's very flexible, and yeah, probably in 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 in, in, in at the three hundredth anniversary of Mendelssohn, we need the the, the 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 Mendelssohn who who fought against anti-Semitism. So I don't hope that, but still, probably it, it would be an option. You could find it in his writings. You could find it in his letters, and of course, you could find it in his biography. So, Lois Dobrin from Smith College. Um, has a suggestion. The ending of Jerusalem is still moving, where Moses Mendelssohn discussed what true tolerance is. I don't have my copyright at hand, but we all know the passage. And she also says that true tolerance means recognition of diversity of us all. Um, that's a comment. And we have a question, how was, if at all, the, 20, the 250th anniversary of Mendelssohn's birth observed in Germany in 1979. <laughs> okay. I was not there personally, but, <laughs> but still, I think I can say something. Should I say something about it? I mean, it's, it's, 
I also think it's fascinating. I once called it, it's a Jewish memory without Jews because um, the, the 250th birthday of Mendelssohn was celebrated in East Germany and it was also celebrated in West Germany, but quite differently. So when you look to East Germany, it was a very, very small celebration only in Dessau. So the, the state secretary for a church affairs, Klaus Gysi, wrote um, a letter to, to one official in, in Dessau that um, they do not wish that Mendelssohn is celebrated in Berlin, although the Jewish community of Berlin, the very small Jewish community of Berlin had already organized a, a of course, very small celebration. But he, his order was that um, the celebration of Mendelssohn should be limited to Dessau. And there were several, they, they, they erected a memorial of Mendelssohn in, in, the, in the park and they had several speeches, a small celebration, but nothing very special. So in, whereas in West Germany, um, you, had, what was, you had several celebrations, you had several articles in newspapers. Um, they invented the uh, Moses Mendelssohn Medaille Prize in Berlin. Um, but what struck me as odd is, but there were no, they don't, no, no celebrations organized by the state. But what, we, what struck me as odd was that both celebrations um, took place without almost any particip active participation of Jews. So the articles were primarily written by non-Jews, the speeches were held by non-Jews, the only Jew who actually um, held a speech was Alexander Altman. But um, yeah, it, it's the Jewish community of Berlin was not involved in the organization of celebrations in Berlin and the same is true for East Germany where the Jewish community was also not asked to contribute anything substantial. Um, to the celebration. So as you can see that non-Jews um, instrumentalized the memory of Mendelssohn in order to present themselves as New Germany, um, as tolerant Germany. They um, somehow instrumentalized the rich um, Jewish history of Germany. Um, I wouldn't call it whitewashing, but I would say that yeah, it was a Jewish memory without Jewish participation. So I would like to be tolerant because it's very late in Vienna. Oh. I'd like to have a final round. Okay. Start with Michael, then Abigail, and then Martina, and uh, each one will say whatever he or she wants, and then we'll uh, close the discussion. I, I will just relate to the question uh, to your answer also, I thought it was kind of ironical, of course, that Klaus Gysi, whom you cited, uh, was the Minister of Church Affairs, it was called, but he was Jewish, and the father of uh, prominent politician Gregor Gysi, and that was also interesting. Maybe he also didn't want to put too much, you know, he, he never made, you know, most people didn't know he was Jewish. Uh, but what I wanted to say also, I don't know how the 1979 uh, celebrations were in Germany, but I was in high school then. And uh, what just came to my mind, um, so I was in high school in a small Bavarian town, but I also had Jewish religious lessons once a week, uh, you know, like Sunday school here, it was afternoon. And there was a rabbi, I think, about... Uh, 12 or 13 years, I had the same uh, teacher, rabbi. Um, and most of the, um, almost all of the Jews in this part uh, were East European Jews. And Mendelssohn, in whatever I remember from my, from these, you know, Jewish school days, uh, was definitely not dealt positively, but negatively. And I do remember later in the 90s when I gave, was invited to give a lecture to teachers of Jewish religion, which is taught in Germany in, in regular high schools, um, it was still the same. And it was in the more early 90s. Um, many of them being of either from Israel or East European background, 
And it was definitely very far from the German Jewish reception of Mendelssohn. It was typically the East European Askala Zionist tradition. I think it is different today in Germany, in, in also in Jewish uh, religious lessons, uh, in Jewish schools. You said, of course, the Moses Mendelssohn Gymnasium in Berlin, and it's named after him. But of course, most of the students, I think, are non-Jewish in the Jewish gymnasium, in the Jewish high school. Uh, so I think it's different today, but I was just thinking that could be also a little interesting footnote, how Mendelssohn was ta 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 taught to the small Jewish community in post-war Germany. May I add something very quickly to that? Hello, may I add something very yes. quickly? Okay, just, I have just a remark to, to what Michael said and to 1979. I also checked for that jubilee, although it's not included in that book, I also checked the, the files of the, cent the Central Council of Jews Living in Germany. So, and they organized a youth meeting, their, their biannual or annual youth meeting. Um, and the title was, what does Moses Mendelssohn mean to, mean to us today? And they had problems to, to, to um, recruit young people to participate in that meeting, young Jewish people to participate in that meeting. And when I see the, when I saw the list of the participants, I contacted some of them and I asked them, some of them are very prominent today, and I asked them, so what did you talk about Mendelssohn at that? And they said, what Mendelssohn? We didn't talk about him at all. I mean, it's, we, talk, we talked about something else. So just as a remark, what, what Michael said, so I can underline that from, from the files. I wanted to uh, say something about um, Moses uh, Mendelssohn in America, something very important that I uh, learned from you. And by the way, um, I agree with Lois that if I were, you know, that w well, actually when I teach a course on German Jews, I do teach Jerusalem. I make a point of teaching it. And I think that is, that is where we should be going <laughs> um, with the next generation. Absolutely. So you asked at one point, what did the German Jews bring with them to, to the United States? And uh, my sense is that they, they probably did bring the B-Or, and that a lot of them brought prayer books that had um, Mendelssohn's translations in them. So they, they brought Mendelssohn with them through his, um, his translations that were in the Zox uh, prayer books, and this is my theory. And, and there's a very important piece of American Jewish history in terms of the reception of, German, of Germany in America that I want to make that I learned from your book. Um, so at one point, and I, don't, I can't date it from my notes, but there was a kind of split that, that, that um, at some point in the 19th century, um, you said that German Jews who came to America, that, that they were not ready to give up their hard-won <laughs> association with the German nation. And that um, in the commemorations, there was a, a split. And one path was they used the commemoration to strengthen their ident connection with German culture. So to commemorate Mendelssohn, but also to mention Luther and Natan and Lessing and that, you know, and that, that Mendelssohn became here in America a way uh, to help strengthen those kind of must have been fading memories fading um, identity as Germans, not as German Jews, but as Germans, and that he was, but, and that the other approach to commemorating him was to strengthen, um, to use him to strengthen American reform Judaism. In other words, Men Mendelssohn is now inspiring us, not as a, not as a German, but as a, you know, in our own um, project of building American reform, the American reform movement. I thought that was a really fascinating um, kind of, if I understand it, kind of divergence, which, you know, today goes without saying that, I mean, most American Jews don't speak German or care that much about um, their German heritage. Um, and that, um, but that, that in the 19th century, those were kind of two options for American rabbis giving the sermon, you know, and, mem and uh, commemorating the jubileum, if I understand correctly. That was very interesting. Martina, would you like to say something in conclusion? Or? To conclude? <laughs> you, you don't have to. Uh, at, 
yeah, at, at the moment, I just want to thank everyone for the discussion. I mean, this is, would I still continue with, with writing a, a second book on Mendelssohn? I, I, you, you gave me a lot of material and, and food thoughts, so to say. But <laughs> no, it's, yeah, thanks so much for, for referring to all these interesting aspects I raised in my book and adding your own thoughts about it. I mean, this is something I think you never can complete such a word break, but um, what I when I read that book, what I what I wondered was um, I would like to, to see another book about Jewish collective memory, not Jewish collective Holocaust memory, but about another Yudi Memoir, which was equally popular or was also in, had an entangled history or something like that. So what I really hope to inspire with that book is just to, to, to inspire other people to, to think about that, to think about Jewish collective, collective memory in that way, to think about it not in terms of Holocaust memory, but to, um, to think about Jewish collective memory before 1945. Just to, because I think Mendelssohn is only a very, very tiny part of that story. And of course, it's very elective and absolutely aware of that. And I think there are so many, there are various equally interesting aspects, Yudi Memoirs, which deserve to be um, researched and analyzed by, of, but of course, by other people. Maybe, maybe it's time to do a Jewish Yudi Memoir, three volumes. Like Hagen Schultz, all seven volumes, like uh, you know that. Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> That's a great idea. With what we remember and what we forget. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. You're the perfect you. editor for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to enroll all all of you to write uh, to write entries. Happy to do it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Martina. Abigail okay, Gimbas, nice Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You. Okay, bye. Good night to Vienna. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And you are good thank evening you. to you, all of you. And thanks for discussing my book. I very much appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the Hope book. Hope to see you here. Hope to see you soon, face Hope to face. Together, personally. Okay, until then, stay healthy and take care. Okay. Bye.